We're having a great evening. Congratulations to everybody who's been part of this so far. And now we have reached the moment of our program where we're going to hear from our featured speaker. The son of a pregnancy center director, Seth Gruber, was raised in the pro-life movement and has been speaking publicly on behalf of the unborn since the age of 19. He has spoken across the United States, educating and equipping pro-life advocates to be a gracious and persuasive voice for unborn children. A compelling and passionate voice for the unborn, Seth is reaching all generations and is helping change the way that our country thinks about and interacts with abortion. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker for tonight's dinner, please welcome to the podium, Mr. Seth Gruber. Good evening, beautiful people of Kentucky. Uh, the reason I say that is because I'm from California. And you all laugh, exactly, because we're the butt end of a joke right now in this country. We're the laughing stock of the republic. Um, and we'll get into a little bit about why that is and exactly what is going on in California. But I always uh, love being with uh, Right to Life groups and pregnancy resource centers because this is very much my heritage and my background. I've really been a pro-life activist since I was a fetus, if you will. I've been swimming in these waters for a long time, quite literally. Uh, my mother was the director of a pregnancy resource center in Los Angeles County from the mid-1980s until 1991 when I was born, so I'm 30 years old now. And uh, she remained the executive director of that pregnancy center until she gave birth to me, like all nine months, right? Uh, and so I was uh, helping save babies as a fetus. Um, so this really goes back to the beginning of my life, which is why it's so wonderful to be with such like-minded warriors. I was homeschooled through eighth grade. I went to public high school. My senior year, I did my senior project on the issue of abortion because even though I grew up in a pro-life home and family, I realized that I didn't have the intellectual tools I felt like I needed to defend my pro-life beliefs to my pro-choice friends at a public school campus, which would be most of them in LA County, right? And so I chose to do my senior project on the issue of abortion. Everyone had to do this to graduate. You had to do field work hours. You had to write a research paper, and you had to give a public speech at the end of the year. And so I picked abortion, and Whittier High School, uh, Nixon's alma mater, about 25 minutes from downtown Los Angeles, said, uh, yeah, Seth, you can't pick that topic. Uh, we have a list here of banned topics. Um, oh, look, abortion's on there, sorry. Uh, to which I said, um, here's a copy of the Constitution you're making me study in government class right now. I recommend you read it. I uh, not so subtly threatened a lawsuit um, to Whittier High School. Uh, to which they backed off, and I immediately did that. For kicks and giggles, my freshman year of college, I was like, I'm just going to go back to Whittier High School's website. I'm just going to pull up the senior project portion of the website, guidelines, topics. Oh, that document's gone, which just goes to show the importance of standing up for truth, standing for life in the public square, looking the enemy in the face and say, sit down, Satan, get behind me. Because we are talking about Satan's sacrament today. We're talking about the centerpiece of secular liberalism or secular progressivism. Abortion is the animating feature of what we call sort of secular progressivism. I'll get into that a little bit later as to why that is, because I think for us as Christians and believers, if we don't actually recognize this, we're not going to have our spiritual loins girded up to contend against the culture of death. We need to understand why the left is so obsessed with abortion. It's not just that they love abortion because it enables them to achieve this sort of 1973 sexual revolution sales pitch, remember, which was that women need abortion to be equal with men. I mean, some of you guys remember that was the talking point. That was the argument because, you know, uh, we have these pesky uteruses. In fact, and in fact, that was what the Cosmopolitan was pushing way back then, was that for women to be equal with men, we have these internal mechanisms that allow us to have babies, wrote the Cosmopolitan during the sexual revolution. And so to be equal with men so they don't have to take a break from climbing up the corporate ladder to give birth, we need abortion. Only then will we be equal with men. It's not purely that they love abortion for that reason. It's also how the liberal establishment, and I use that term very broadly, we can call them the abortion industrial complex, okay? Because <laughs> it's not just the abortion industry, right? It's all the culture of death. It's Hollywood. It's the universities who all push this pro-abortion worldview. It's how they prop up their political regime. It's how they justify every other policy issue and prescription that they care about. Why? Because we say, if you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right. Right? But the left has an antonym of that statement. They have the inverse of that statement. It goes something like this. If you can invert the right to life 
and convince the American public that that right can be taken from an entire class of human beings who haven't met their parents' litmus test of wanted. And you can get them to champion the right to take human life, then there's no other natural right you can't invert. There's nothing else that you can't sell to the American public and indoctrinate them into championing. That's why they care so much about abortion. It's not just so they can have women's equality or whatever that means. Except for preborn women, of course, right? Where are their reproductive rights? <laughs> it's, it's how they can justify everything else that they do. And if they can get the church, the bride and body of Christ, to make peace with Satan's sacrament, then they can get the church to sit down and remain silent on every other form of tyranny that they push on the American people. Now, I know you're thinking, okay, I thought this was a pro-life speaker. Why is he talking about other political issues? Because it's all related. Because they care about all of these issues. But abortion is that sacrament. It's that centerpiece of secular progressivism. And yet, I think the enemy has overplayed his hand in the last couple years. Don't you? Don't you see a rising and a girding up of loins and courage amongst the American people? And maybe even that most powerful organism in the country who, if she were to wake up, we could turn this entire American experiment around. I'm talking about the bride of Christ, ladies and gentlemen. I'm talking about the church. Those who worship an unborn child. Jesus doesn't become human at the moment of birth. He doesn't become the God-man at the moment of birth. He becomes the God-man at the moment of conception. He's the greatest former fetus to have ever existed. Christ identifies with us from our most vulnerable stage, the prenatal stage, enters human history in a uterus he once knit together to redeem mankind from their sins. This is why you've got the prenatal John the Baptist doing backflips in the womb when Mary walks into the room pregnant with God who is at that point knitting John the Baptist together in the womb while he knits himself together in the womb because he's God from the moment of conception. Poof! <laughs> Incarnation, right? If, if, you're, if, you, you, if you lost the wonder to your Christian faith, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, just spend some time thinking about the Incarnation for a few minutes, right? Every Christmas, we're like, oh, what? The gospel, beautiful and incarnational faith. If the church who worships an unborn child can't wake up and get their lazy butt off their theological armchairs and get comfortable with being uncomfortable to contend in the public square for the least least of these, for the orphan, then who will? Right, scripture says the um, pure and undefiled religion is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress. And you know what the church has missed for so long? If we're supposed to care for the orphan whose life is endangered because his parents are now dead. How much more ought we to love and care for the orphan in the womb whose life is endangered because his parents want him dead? The orphan outside the womb tragically has already lost their parents. The orphan in the womb has their death being scheduled by their parents. And we as the church who tell ourselves that we would have been abolitionists, we would have been with Abraham Lincoln, we would have been Harriet Tubman's, right? We would have been Frederick Douglass's. Oh, if I lived in Germany in 1940, I would have been best friends with Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We all tell ourselves this. Come on, be honest. Right, Robert P. George, one of the you know, academic heroes of the conservative movement who teaches at Princeton, I believe, he always asks his, his uh, law students every semester, he says, by raise of hands, how many of you would have been abolitionists if you lived in 1850s America? And he's been asking this for like two decades. And he's like, it's the strangest thing. Every semester, the entire class always raises their hands. But, but we know that we wouldn't all have been, right? Because that's how powerful bigotry is. Bigotry blinds you to what would otherwise be obvious truths about human nature. This is what C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery. Right, we look down our noses in the chronology of history of 2022, and we heap shame upon our brethren from the 1850s and from 1940s Germany, and we scratch our heads, and we say, how could the body of Christ allow those injustices? We allow our own lynchings. We allow in our own holocaust. They're called womb lynchings, and they happen at the tune of a million a year. In fact, Planned Parenthood alone lynches more unarmed black lives every two weeks than the KKK lynched in a century. 
But the Democrat Party says that, oh, we've reformed, we've moved on from that. We're the party of anti-racism. Sure, sure. Winston Churchill once said in 1943, he explained the almost spiritual climate as he saw it in Germany, as Hitler and the Nazi regime were trying to take over the world and become his gods. And a man who's not a believer, by the way, did you know we have no proof that Winston Churchill was born again? I've done my research. I, there's no proof that he was actually a Christian, and yet he had more moral and spiritual clarity than most of the pulpits in Germany. And he has this line where he explains the situation as he saw it, the tyranny as he saw it, and I think it's so applicable to our times today. He said that the destiny of mankind is not decided by material computation. When great forces are on the move in the world, stirring all men's souls, drawing them from their firesides to cast aside wealth, comfort, and the pursuit of happiness in response to these impulses that are awe-striking and irresistible, we learn that we're spirits and not animals, and that something is going on in space and time and beyond space and time, which, whether we like it or not, spells duty beautiful high language. You don't hear that in today's American political discourse, do you? <laughs> What's he saying? Something is going on. But there's only one who dwells beyond space and time, yeah? He who created space and time. You remember when he uh, breathed out the Milky Way, laughed animals into existence, dropped oceans, and then knit you together in your mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made, more valuable than any other form of life he had made, despite what PETA might tell you. Right? Oh, those cows. Gotta love those cows right to life. PETA's radically pro-abortion, by the way, okay, just so you know that. And yet, not even PETA is living out their convictions that animals are indistinguishable from humans, that we are just another more evolved form of animal, and so therefore the cow has as much rights as the human beings. Not even PETA believes that, because if they did, they would be outside of every, well, I live in California, so I have to say in and out I don't know what the example would be here, but every McDonald's and in and out drive through saying, where are the cow's rights to life? Don't eat that hamburger. They don't actually believe that the cow and the animal is as intrinsically valuable as you. Why? Because eternity is written on the heart of man. We come from God. We've been created by God. Therefore, we can't help but recognize and resonate with the truths that come from God. We live in God's world and we abide by his laws, whether we like it or not. That's the God who created you as the peak and pinnacle of his creation and gives us dominance and dominion over the creation he has made to be stewards of. He's the one who dwells beyond space and time. He is the great forces on the move in the world right now, stirring your souls away from your comfortable firesides to get onto the battlefield of the culture of death at what may be the most politically propitious year in my lifetime for the rights of the unborn child who find themselves in the same location that our Savior entered human history in to redeem mankind from their sins. That's the clarity Winston Churchill had in 1943, a man who wasn't saved. And I think we are living in a similar Kairos moment right now. You know the difference between Kronos and Kairos? Not a Kronos moment, a Kairos moment. Or to quote my friend Charlie Kirk, a turning point for the country and the church. But this, so much of the issues we're facing in our country right now go back to our failure to protect the unborn child. And yet, it should be the pulpits and the churches ablaze with righteousness on the front lines of protecting the preborn. So when I went to Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, I was a naive 19-year-old who just thought that all Christians were passionately pro-life. How naive I was. Westmont College is in Montecito, California. It's a few minutes drive from Oprah's house, okay? And everyone in Montecito hates Westmont College because it's a college, so all the students have to drive up through the nice multi-million dollar homes, and all the snobby little people with their, you know, 100-foot bushes that hide themselves from the world are like, oh, those students. That's where Westmont College is, in Santa Barbara, California, 1,200 students. I'm still paying off my loans for going there. I'm almost done. Thank you very much. And yet, it's one of the most progressively leftist, quote-unquote, Christian colleges in the country. This is what Bonhoeffer called syncretism. Syncretism is when you attach pagan ideologies to your faith, but you still masquerade it as Christianity and orthodoxy, okay? Um, so I get to Westmont. I start the first pro-life club that had ever been there. It took me a full semester to find a faculty advisor, a full semester 
to find a Christian professor at a Christian university to simply sign a sheet of paper to say I'll be your faculty advisor to get my pro-life club approved. Well, I quickly learned that there were a whole bunch of pro-abortion students and faculty teaching professors who signed a statement of faith at Westmont College. And I know this because I have email debates with them and I could prove it to you. I flagged them, I saved them all from 2012. I'll, I'll put them in a book one day or sometime. Pathetic, absolutely ridiculous. And so one time, my faculty advisor sends me an email correspondence from an email thread that he was included in. We had had a pro-life speaker at Westmont. I think it was the last pro-life speaker they've ever had. And by the way, I'll never get invited back to my university. You know how Christian universities, they bring back their alumni and they let them speak in chapel? And they show the student body, look what our alumni do for the body of Christ and the kingdom of God and the culture. Yeah, I'll be lynched before I'm allowed to speak in chapel at Westmont College. Uh, well, actually, they're okay with lynchings at Westmont College as long as they're prenatal lynchings. as long as they're womb lynchings, which is a more, far more accurate way to describe abortion. Abortion itself is kind of a euphemism, isn't it? It's not an abortion, it's a killing of an innocent human being whose, whose parents called them unwanted. And yet at Westmont College, you can sign a statement of faith and you can be responsible for shaping the minds of the next generation of Christian leaders and believe it's okay to slaughter children in the womb through all nine months of pregnancy. So some of these professors got together, as is the tendency in higher academia, if any of you are academics, I'm not speaking down to you. I know some brave, absolute cultural warrior academics who care more about truth than their own reputation in the community. But we all know the stereotypes of academia. And so these professors were on an email thread talking about how they would have done that pro-life chapel, how crappy that pro-life speaker was. But they accidentally included the faculty advisor of the pro-life club <laughs> while they're complaining and getting high off their own intellectual flatulence, if you will. And so my faculty advisor sends me this comment from one of the professors, and it's incredibly indicative of the state of the church because the pro-life movement doesn't have the church on our side because we don't have most of the pastors on our side. Thank you for the pastors who are here. Amen. Hallelujah. We don't have most of the pastors on our side because the institutions they're being educated at to be preachers and pastors are filled with what C.S. Lewis called men without chests. Right, the head rules the belly through the chest. If you haven't read The Abolition of Man, he means the intellect rules the animal raw appetite through the chest. The chest is morality virtue. If you remove morality and virtue, then the intellect rules the animal with nothing to temper it in between. And aren't human beings really good at coming up with justifications for our sinful moral behaviors when we're not accountable to a moral code? And he who created that moral code. Most of the seminaries and Christian institutions where the next generation of Christian leaders and pastors are being educated at are filled with men without chests who take abortion and view abortion as just one among many issues. They don't view it as the dominant moral issue of our day, as what we you would call a genocide. They view it as just, ah, just you know, poverty, soup kitchens, uh, you know, health care, um, and abortion. You know, they're just all kind of morally equivalent. This is why you had the pro-life evangelicals for Biden group in 2020 leading up to the election. Anyone remember that group, by the way? Pro-life evangelicals for Biden. Have you heard of their new group, by the way? It's called Fiscal Conservatives for Karl Marx. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's beautiful. No, don't laugh. It's not a contradiction, okay? You, you just don't get it because you're not woke. And their last one I saw, it was called um, Believe All Women for Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, it's beautiful. One, now, of course, you know, I, I, it's funny, right? Because, of course, one thing is not like the other. Pro-lifers don't vote for or support Joe Biden, the most radical pro-abortion American president and politician in American history who makes Barack Obama look like a pragmatic pro-choice moderate. But you had these people come out and you have these people in our colleges who say, I'm pro-life, but I vote for Democrats and pro-abortion Democrats, by the way, because they're good at quality of life policies outside the womb. Maybe they're not good at protection of life in the womb, but they're good at quality of life outside the womb. Anyone who sacrifices protection of life in the womb for quality of life outside the womb is someone with a broken moral compass who you should not trust with political power. But these are the kind of people at my Christian colleges, and by the way, at Christian colleges all across this country. By the way, there are about five Christian universities I would send my children to in this country. And if you think I've overstated my case and I'm now a kooky conservative conspiracy theorist, I would gently and graciously submit to you that you might not know how much our Christian colleges are rotting before our very eyes. 
my alma mater is more committed to creating advocates for the enemy with the veneer of Christianity than they are to the historic Orthodox Christian tradition. So here's the two sentences from a Christian professor at Westmont College on how real, enlightened, uh, smart Christians ought to deal with difficult moral issues like the issue of abortion. Here's what he said. The moral particularities of abortion are so fine textured and open textured that Manichaean distinctions about being pro or anti-abortion strike me as ethically obtuse. Our community and our students are best served when our chapel speakers invite us to tarry in the liminal spaces of complexity. Now, I don't know what that means either. <laughs> and I wish I could tell you that was just a parody of professorial academic thinking. But unfortunately, that's much more of a window into our culture's deep-seated confusion on the issue of abortion. And that confusion has snuck into the pulpit, who is supposed to be the counselor to the king in America, to quote my friend Bill Federer. Every king has a counselor. Who's the king in America? We, the people. Who are the counselors? the pulpit, the church, those who remind people that there is a God and you are not him. <laughs> and you will one day be accountable to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who entered history as a fetus to redeem mankind from their sins. But this perspective that treats abortion as just one among many issues is really a way to say that the right to life is just one among many rights. But what a silly thing to say. Because if you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right. And Reagan, the former governor of the once great state of California, used to be pro-choice, if you didn't know that, and he signed legislation in California that did lead to additional bloodshed of unborn babies. Reagan regretted it his whole life. In fact, I was looking at your beautiful pamphlet here of some of the speakers of Louisville or Kentucky Right to Life banquets since 1974, and I saw the name Dr. Mildred Jefferson a couple times. The first black woman to have graduated from Harvard Medical School, who started the National Right to Life Organization, one of the oldest pro-life organizations in the country, and turned Reagan pro-life. She made a case for the pro-life position on national television. Reagan watched it, and we still have the letter that he wrote to her, thanking her and mourning over the fact that he wished he had heard her case before he signed that legislation. Reagan went on to write his book, Abortion and the Conscience of a Nation, because he understood that abortion, like slavery, really is the litmus test of our republic, isn't it? It forces us to answer that question, do we still believe that these truths are self-evident, that we're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are the right to property? Oh, wait, no, they put the right to life first. I wonder why. Because if you don't get the right to life right, Every other right is meaningless. And Reagan articulated this once his heart was warmed to the plight of the unborn child in his book. And here's what he said. He said, Abraham Lincoln recognized that we could not survive as a free land as long as some men could decide that others are not fit to be free and should therefore become slaves. Likewise, says Reagan, we cannot survive as a free country today as long as some men can decide that others are not fit to live and should therefore be abandoned to abortion and infanticide. So says Reagan, there is no cause more important than affirming than the transcendent right to life of all human beings, the right without which no other rights have any meaning. So if we paraphrase Reagan today, we say, if you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right. And did we see this play out in real time in the last 18 months or two years, folks? primarily in kooky Democrat states run by absolute maniacs, like my governor in California. We call him Governor Gavin Mussolini. You can borrow that from me if you'd like, Governor Mussolini. What happened to our natural right to liberty and property? You can't run your businesses in accordance with your best judgment. You can't gather. You can't hug. You better not go to Granny's house because those Democrat follow the science Fauci figures, what did they call us? Granny killers. Do you remember that, that, that rhetoric? You're a granny killer if you go visit grandma and give her a hug, even though the grandparents are begging their adult children to come over and see their grandkids and their adult children who went to UC freaking Berkeley who are follow the science Fauci disciples say, get out of my sight, mom and dad. I can't tell you how many times I heard this story. Families destroyed through adult children who believe that COVID was this incredibly dangerous thing to their five-year-old 
and wouldn't let them see their own grandparents? What happened to our natural right to liberty as churches were being sued for gathering, or if you're in California, for singing? Yeah, some of you laughed, you remembered that. Yeah, because you follow national news. You shouldn't follow California state news. You'll just be too discouraged, okay? But yes, in California, Newsom Lini came out and he said, no more singing. But he only meant for Christians. You see, if you were a saint or a deacon in the state church of secular progressivism, which is the only state religion today, and you masqueraded through the streets of Hollywood, Los Angeles, Detroit, Chicago, Seattle, Name any other kooky leftist city, and you burnt whole city blocks to the ground. And you screamed, America sucks, burn it down, which is the hymnal book of the religion of secular progressivism. That's the first hymn you see when you open it up there. And the spittle flew off your lips, and you gathered in the thousands to defeat systemic racism. Except they were all pro-abortion, and abortion is the greatest modern example of systemic racism, but don't get me started. If you did that, the same people who called conservative Christians granny killers, who gathered in churches at 50% full capacity, were silent. When two, three, four, five, six thousand people gathered without face diaper, I'm sorry, masks, and burnt down whole city blocks. So COVID got woke. It only targeted religious conservatives. Therefore, those leftist burn whole city blocks, Black Lives Matter Antifa gatherings, they, they weren't super spreaders. And Eric Garcetti, the mayor of Los Angeles, and Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, came out, if you remember this, and he thanked the rioters and the protesters for bringing awareness to systemic racism. So COVID can differentiate between political ideologies? Whoa, this is a gnarly virus! What was going on at Wuhan Institute of Virology? Holy moly! Or it's all bunk, it's all crap, and they know it, but they're using it to accrue political power. What's my point? Those who murder children should not be trusted to help children. If you get the right to life wrong, you're going to abuse literally every other right that flows from that first and most important of all rights. And Reagan recognized that many years ago. It's about time the left and squishy conservatives who do nothing to contend in the public square for righteousness start learning that lesson and contending for that first and most important of all rights. The rights and liberties we abandon today will be the rights and liberties our grandchildren never knew existed. This is what we're facing. So when great forces are on the move in the world, everyone has a duty. I'm not telling you that if God has burdened your heart with a different injustice or cause, that you need to abandon that and become a full-time pro-life activist. I'm not saying that. I believe God sends his soldiers to many different battlefronts and many different wars. I am, however, saying that while many issues are important, amen, hallelujah, they don't all carry the same moral weight. What do I mean by this? When I tell you 1855 America, what do you think of? <gasps> Who said slavery? You narrow-minded, single-issue voting bigot. Why did you think of slavery? You know, women didn't have equal voting rights. Are they not as important as the black man? No, because you recognize that while that was a very important issue as well, it wasn't as significant as treating black men and women like cattle. When I tell you 1940s Germany, what issue do you think of? You think of the Holocaust. Oh, you guys, you know, there were brothels being operated in Germany. Why didn't you think of that issue? Is that not close to the heart of God? No, because you recognize the simple truth that while many issues are important and our Father in Heaven cares about all of them, they don't all carry the same moral weight. This is why we judge the church for their apathy on slavery and their apathy on the Holocaust, because those issues like abortion today was the litmus test of those countries, and it's the litmus test of the church today. So I'm saying everyone has a duty, role, and responsibility to play in ending the greatest genocide in human history. So what must we do? Well, we have to engage. Surrender is not an option. We have to equip ourselves to engage, and we have to sacrifice to engage. We have to engage. If, 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 that, if that's not through to you yet, I, I should probably just end my speech now. I, I don't know what else to do to persuade you. In California, they're becoming a sanctuary state for abortion. 
and the office of Gavin Newsom turned, uh, teamed up with the Future of Abortion Council to craft 45 recommendations to turn California into a sanctuary state for killing babies. Because the left is predicting more than conservatives are predicting that Roe versus Wade will fall in June, conservative states like Kentucky will ban abortion, so California legislators are saying, we need to become a beacon of Molech. Uh, I'm sorry, they're saying a beacon of hope. And, and we need to tell women coming from more conservative red states who want to kill their babies that you'll be safe to do so here. And yes, they use the word safe. It's very ironic. Safe for whom? Certainly not for the child. And among those 45 recommendations were some absolutely maniacal um, goals, such as taxpayer dollars in California paying for the gas, travel expenses, food, and hotel of women traveling from Arizona to come to California, including her babysitting for her children at home while she goes to California to kill those children's siblings. This is in the Future of Abortion California report. I have a podcast called Unaborted with Seth Gruber because we're all unaborted. And if you subscribe to it, give us five stars. It helps us reach more people. It's one of the biggest pro-life podcasts in the world. We appreciate it. It's growing a lot. We're trying to equip, encourage, and educate the public and the church to contend against Satan's sacrament. I talk about all that in the podcast if you want to know more. That was just one of the many things they're pushing for in California. And yesterday, Newsom signed a bill to make abortions cheaper and to subsidize it with tax dollars. And he's just getting started. So uh, do we have a role to engage? Uh, yes. Against this? Absolutely. And if we can't unify to end the greatest genocide in human history, I don't think we can unify to promote righteousness anywhere if we flinch at the one point that the church is needed the most. But you know, we have many lessons to learn from our spiritual forefathers, amen? Which is why the left hates teaching correct history in schools, by the way. Right, it's why they don't want the history of how many states had banned slavery like shortly after the inception of the country. How many of the founding fathers wanted to ban slavery in the founding documents but weren't allowed to. They don't want those facts getting into the schools because it will cause children to have a more correct view of the republic. And if you have a more correct view of the republic, guess what, you don't become a leftist. <laughs> okay, so, so this is why they care so much about this, and this is why many people don't know the names Dietrich Bonhoeffer, William Wilberforce, Sophie and Hans Scholl, which were mentioned earlier of the White Rose Resistance. Sophie Scholl, a 21-year-old, a former Nazi youth who became horrified at the atrocities being committed against the Jews and the rights of the Germans as well, and began printing and distributing anti-Nazi literature and pamphlets. Thousands sent across Germany until one day they entered the University of Munich, and she tossed 300 pamphlets from the third floor down to the atrium below and a pro, and a pro abortion, the same thing, pro-Nazi janitor saw what she did, arrested her and her brother Hans Scholl, and four days later they were guillotined, had their heads chopped off, and the executioner was so moved by Sophie Scholl's bravery, he later said he had never seen anyone whose execution he oversaw be as brave and courageous facing death as Sophie Scholl, a 21-year-old in love with Jesus, young woman who had goals of becoming a teacher, and her final words as recorded by the executioners in the room were, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give themselves up individually to a righteous cause? such a fine sunny day and I have to go. But what does my death matter if through us thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? 48 seconds from the time she was taken out of her cell to when the blade fell on her head, her brother and their friend Christopher Probst followed soon after. And their heroism and courage in the face of tyranny has inspired Christians for decades to face their own injustices. It's the same thing with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the founder of the Confessing Church. Do you know why they called themselves the Confessing Church? To tacitly insinuate that if you wouldn't join them in standing against the genocide of Jews and you were being co-opted into silence by the German state, you might not be preaching and confessing the real Christ. Why else call themselves the Confessing Church except to create a line of demarcation between themselves and the Deutschchristens? The Deutschchristens, the German church. I don't mean the church that found itself in the geographical territory of Germany. When I say the German church, I mean the Germans church. The churches that were owned and operated by the Germans and were told to preach Nazi bigotry from their pulpits. Well, Eberhard Bethke, one of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's best friends, and his first biographer, if you ever want to read a biographer, a biography on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the first one written was written by the only man who actually knew Bonhoeffer. His name was Eberhard Bethke. Bethke was a member of the Confessing Church. He survived the Holocaust. As you may know, Bonhoeffer did not. He was assassinated 
by the Nazis days before the war ended. And one of, one of Hitler's last orders before he shot himself in the head was you make sure Bonhoeffer's killed. Because Bonhoeffer was killed because of his failed assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler's life, arranged by the confessing church, those who were resisting the Nazi tyranny. And Eberhard Bethke later explained the situation as he saw it, and I want to read you his words, because I think when you hear it, you're going to go, oh, is that applicable to our time today? <laughs> we need to learn from our spiritual forefathers. Here's what Bethke said. He said, Bonhoeffer introduced us in 1935 to the problem of what we today call political resistance. Yes, churches then also had disagreements and division over getting political. You know, the Christians who say, just preach the gospel. Uh, yes, preach the gospel, but when I mean the gospel, I mean the full counsel of God, brothers and sisters. I mean living the gospel and contending for the rights of our neighbors. So he's saying the same thing. They had those same division in the church then. Oh, that Pastor Bonhoeffer, he's a Republican hack. When really he was just like, actually Bonhoeffer once said, political action means taking on responsibility. This cannot happen without power. Power is to serve responsibility. Because power, like money, is not intrinsically evil, is it? The love of money is the roots of all kind of evil. The love and abuse of power. Power and money are not intrinsically evil in and of themselves, and Bonhoeffer understood that. So Bethke said, Bonhoeffer introduced us to this problem of what we today call political resistance. The levels of confession, by confession, guys, he means proclamation. He doesn't mean like confessing sins. He means to proclaim. The levels of confession and resistance could no longer be kept neatly apart. The escalating persecution of the Jews generated an increasingly intolerable situation, especially for Bonhoeffer. We now realize, we, the confessing church, we now realize that mere, mere confession, no matter how courageous, inescapably meant complicity with the murderers even though there would always be new acts of refusing to be co-opted, and even though we could preach Christ alone Sunday after Sunday. But during the whole time, the Nazi state never considered it necessary to prohibit such preaching. Why should it? Okay, pause. You hear what he just said? He says, we were confessing all of the right creeds. We were confessing that we were up against the Holocaust, that we didn't like it. But this confession merely by itself meant complicity with the murderers, so much so that the Nazi state loved the fact that we were keeping our orthodoxy in the church. We were keeping our liturgy in the church. It was faith without works. And I think there's a book that says something about that kind of faith being dead. This is what Bethke's saying. He's saying during this whole time, the Nazi state wasn't prohibiting our preaching. Why? Because the Nazis are saying, oh, that's great. You want to espouse anti-Holocaust beliefs? Okay, that's awesome. Just say it in the church and keep it there. Don't you take your faith out into the public square and begin contending for the rights of the Jews. Don't you pose a threat to our political regime. It was mere confession and not resistance. And Satan, the Lord of flies, the prince of demons, wants nothing more than that, brothers and sisters, for us as his sons and daughters to merely confess and feel all the right things and take no action. In fact, in the screw tape letters, you guys read the screw tape letters? By C.S. Lewis, Lewis explains Satan's strategy in doing this, the same strategy that the Nazis imposed against the church and which Bethke is articulating here. Screw tape mentoring uh, Wormwood, the junior demon. What does screw tape says? He says, hey, Wormwood, as the humans have said, active habits are strengthened by repetition, but passive ones are weakened. The longer he, who's he? Us, the longer he feels without acting, the less he will be able ever to act. And in the long run, the less he will be able to feel at all. What is C.S. Lewis telling us is the strategy of Satan? Let them feel and say all of the right creeds and beliefs, but as long as he doesn't take action on what he feels and the evil that he sees, the sooner he won't be able to act at all. And the longer he doesn't act about the evil that he sees in front of him, the sooner he won't even feel. In other words, you'll become a spiritual little blob of a couch potato whose Christianity is meaningless. 
How is that for commentary about what Bethke meant when he said, during the whole time, the Nazi state did not consider it necessary to prohibit our preaching because it was what Bonhoeffer would later call cheap grace, a grace in Jesus you've created in your own image to justify your apathy or participation in evil. Bethke continues, and he finishes and says, thus we were approaching this borderline between confession and resistance. And if we did not cross this border, our confession was going to be no better than cooperation with the criminal. And so it became clear where the problem lay for the confessing church. And what was that problem? We were resisting by way of confession, but we were not confessing by way of resistance. In other words, the only way that their anti-Holocaust beliefs manifest themselves was through words. It was just linguistic resistance. <laughs> but they weren't getting off the bench, getting their boots on the ground, and getting their hands dirty to love their Jewish neighbors who were being holocausted. Is that not a perfect description of the American church on the issue of abortion today? Oh, we're a super pro-life church. Oh my gosh, Seth. <laughs> Corey, you wouldn't believe, we have the local pregnancy resource center to our church once a year, and we give her five minutes to share about what they do to save babies from the lynching that might be scheduled on the calendar, and we make a one-time donation to the local Right to Life and Pregnancy Resource Center group once a year. You've probably never met a more pro-life Christian. Now, I know I'm offending some of your sensibilities tonight, and if I'm not invited back, that's fine. What I'm saying is that your gift in a little bit is not enough. That's actually what I'm saying. I'm saying if you want to know how you would have lived, if you took a time machine with Marty McFly back to 1850s America or 1940s Germany, if you were born in that time in that place and you want to know if you would have been a Harriet Tubman, if you would have been a Dietrich Bonhoeffer and a Sophie Scholl, the answer to your question is the degree to which you engage the issue of abortion today. Now, why is that? Because they're all wrong for the same reason. In each circumstance, the government denied personhood to an entire class of human beings and used euphemisms to justify their mistreatment and slaughter. So the Hiskerich, the German Supreme Court, denied personhood to Jews. Dred Scott, America, we denied personhood to blacks. And in 1973, in Roe v. Wade, Justice Blackmun said, the term person is used in the Constitution does not include the unborn. Anytime the term human from person has been ripped apart, disastrous consequences have followed. And usually millions of people end up getting slaughtered. We would never separate the term human from person, would we? Like human, person, it's, those are synonyms. But the culture of death must always separate those terms in order to justify they're genocide. But we've become so accustomed to the evil of abortion in America today that we have made peace with it. And we have told ourselves that our one-time donation to the local Right to Life Club is the best form of Christian resistance to which today's genocidal maniacs and practitioners of genocide say the same thing to us that the Nazi state said to the confessing church, which is thank you. Thank you for manifesting your resistance in such small ways, ways that make you feel good about contending against abortion, but don't make a meaningful difference to tear down the high places of Molech. What have we allowed by not resisting? Well, 63 million children have been killed. Fathers can't defend their own children. And animals have more protections than human beings, which is why in Colorado a year and a half ago, they had two voting items on the ballot. One was if they were going to protect the gray wolf, and the other was if they were going to ban abortions after 22 weeks. They voted overwhelmingly to protect the gray wolf, and they voted overwhelmingly to not ban abortion after 22 weeks, fulfilling G.K. Chesterton's prophetic line when he said, wherever there is animal worship, there will also be human sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, abortion is human sacrifice to the pagan idols of convenience, money, education, and career well-being. And I'm here tonight to tell you that Satan doesn't care the name of the God that you sacrifice your children to. 
was Molech actually an alternative deity? No, because Yahweh means one God, which means any other small g God is not a different deity. It's Satan masquerading as a little freaking bronze dude. <laughs> he was happy to be called Moloch then. He's happy if the culture of death today dubs him the name self, money, and education. As long as you continue to shove children down his throat, he will be happy and say yes and amen, for he is the god of the religion of secular progressivism. You see, abortion is Satan's sacrament. So if you've ever wondered why the culture of death cares so much about protecting abortion, if you've ever scratched your head and gone, what is going on in Seth State? Sanctuary states for abortion? What is going on in Maryland last week with allowing infanticide up to 28 days old? And the left goes, no, we don't mean that, except they won't define the word perinatal, which means after birth. You have to go to WebMD to get a definition or a previous law in a different state to get a definition of perinatal, and that definition is gestation up to 28 days after birth. But the Maryland law refuses to define the word perinatal, so you could have a situation in which a mother refuses to feed, abandons, or murders her infant up to 28 days after birth, and there will be no legal recourse or punishment for that crime. This happened four days ago in Maryland. And Newsom just did the same thing in California, by the way. This bill that could allow infanticide up to 28 days after birth. And we all remember Ben Sass and his bill, the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. You want to know how many times Nancy Pelosi, the grandmother of abortion, and the Democrat Party has vetoed that bill? Over 80 times now. The bill doesn't regulate abortion at all, brothers and sisters. It just says if a baby survives a botched abortion and is born, like my friend Melissa Odin, that the doctor has to care for the child, transfer them to a hospital, and give them all the same level of medical attention and care as any other baby would receive under normal circumstances. And they've vetoed it 83 times. There are demonic principalities behind these people, brothers and sisters, because this is Satan's sacrament. So what do I mean by that? Very shortly, here's what I mean by that. Anyone who turns from God is not listening to God, right? If you're not a son or daughter of the king and your heart has not been regenerated, then you will be being lied to. Your soul will be being preyed upon by demons, Satan. So what lie are they hearing? When the secular progressive movement participates in their liturgy of abortion, what lie are they hearing? The lie from the, the garden, the first lie, the lie that led to every other lie. What does the serpent tell Eve? For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. That's a fascinating lie, is it not? Right, pastors? That's a fascinating lie, because I want to live forever. I want to be like a god. But they already were going to be. They were perfect. They were already going to live forever. They bought the serpent's lie. Eve got woke. And that wokeness destroyed generations. What is wokeness except a new special way to see the world and justify your sin? Because you're a god. God's holding out on you. Do it my way. We kill babies through embryonic stem cell research, fetal tissue research, fetal organ harvesting, and prenatal gene editing. And we tell ourselves it's justified because in the process we'll get to live just a little bit longer. You see, abortion is the pagan replacement for man's pursuit of eternal life. Rather than accepting the broken body and shed blood of Christ for eternal life, the culture of death demands that we break the bodies and shed the blood of babies for eternal life. Which is why Peter Kraft, the Catholic philosopher, put it better than I ever could when he said abortion is the demonic parody of the Eucharist. That's why it uses the same holy word. This is my body, but with the opposite blasphemous meaning. Here is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And the culture of death says no. Break the bodies and shed the blood of babies being knit together by the king of kings so we could live forever. Have you not seen the hysterical fear of death in the secular culture in the last two years? Abortion is that centerpiece of secular progressivism that convinces themselves, ye shall be as gods. Because a god gets to decide who lives and who dies. This is Satan's sacrament. And he's always been behind the killing of babies. This is nothing new. That's what we're facing. I won't even go through the list of what's happened since Biden was elected. 
It's the most pro-abortion political administration in American history, and you have Merrick Garland two months ago threatening to send federal troops into Texas. He's talking about civil war, because he doesn't like Greg Abbott's in Texas, his pro-life legislation, which is saving thousands of unborn children from dismemberment, because it is their sacrament. What do we believe? Well, we actually believe with Dr. Fauci when he says, follow the science. <laughs> I was really hoping that Rand Paul would have been in person tonight because I'm convinced that Dr. Fauci wakes up in night sweats reliving his interactions with Senator Rand Paul. Am I right? <laughs> Boy, do you have a senator here, man. I have some serious senator envy, let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> We just got rid of Kamala Harris, okay? And it didn't get any better, all right? <laughs> Kamala Harris, who as Attorney General, was jailing pro-life investigative journalists and raiding their apartments because Planned Parenthood was lining her pocket with campaign donations while they were being exposed for selling dead baby body parts on the black market. That's the Vice President, allegedly, of the United States of America. We believe in the science that from the moment of conception, there's a distinct living and whole human being because you could be a different gender than your mother, you could have a different blood type, so the body in her body is not her body. Living because dead things don't grow and the unborn child is directing her own internal growth from within. And whole, a whole human being is a human being who already has everything they need to realize their full growth and development as a participating member of the human species. Like a Polaroid camera, when you take the photo and it gets spit out, and remember you shake it, right? All, them, all, them, all the Gen Zers are like, what is that? Is that the new iPhone model? No, the Polaroid cameras, remember? And so let's say you get a picture of a beautiful Kentucky sunset, and as the photo gets spit out, I rip it out of your hands, I tear it up into little pieces, and I throw it into the dirt. Would you be upset with me? But what if I told you, brother, sister, calm down and chill out. It wasn't a picture of a sunset. It was just a black smudgy on a white piece of paper. Now, you would say, Seth, you idiot. The sunset was already there. We just couldn't see it yet. Everything that was necessary for that photo to realize its full development was already present when the photo got spit out. It just needed time. That's what I mean when I say from the moment of conception, you were a distinct living and whole human being who already had everything you needed to realize your full growth and development as a participating member of the human species. Even if we couldn't see you yet, you also just needed time. Hashtag follow the science. But interestingly, that's not the science that Dr. Frankenstein Fauci is interested in following because he funds the University of Pittsburgh through the NIAID with the disgraced former NIH director, Francis Collins, with millions of dollars of funding that they used to scalp the heads of late-term aborted babies who could have survived if born and cared for by heroic doctors in a neonatal unit. They take the scalps of those late second trimester aborted babies, I'm not kidding you if you don't remember this, they insert them subcutaneously on lab rats, and the lab rat begins to grow the infant human hair that would have grown on the head of that precious child had they not been aborted in the womb. And guess what? There's pictures of this. You know who funds those experiments at the University of Pittsburgh? Dr. Frankenstein Fauci. So the next time that little puny degenerate tells you to follow the science, tell him where he can stick that science, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> My point is simply this. It was never about science. It was about power. And nowhere is that more true than the issue of abortion, when the science of embryology that says you began at the moment of conception is denied on the altar of a, of a political ideology that treats abortion as their sacrament. So that's my commentary on Dr. Fauci. And I was really hoping to congratulate your wonderful senator, but maybe someone can send him a clip of this tonight. Lastly, we have to sacrifice to engage. What is our duty? Brothers and sisters, our duty is quite simple. It's to be a Christian. And Jesus, in his brilliance, he, uh, he did this thing in the scripture where he summarized all the law and the prophets. You remember that? They all hang on to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Is the unborn child our neighbor? Well, if they're a human being, they're a neighbor which is what made the question of the lawyer in the parable of the Good Samaritan so offensive when he said, uh, and who is my neighbor? Is it Luke 10, remember? And he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I just forgot Jesus. No. 
He was trying to create a category of neighbor and non-neighbor in order to shirk himself of his responsibility of loving the neighbors that he didn't want to, and there required significant sacrifices to love. There is no class of human beings alive today to whom the question is more frequently directed, are they really neighbors, than the preborn image bearers in our midst. And sometime that question is coming from American pulpits. Our duty is to love our unborn neighbors and their mothers and fathers. And the last example for you tonight comes from a man named Oscar Schindler, who took that second greatest commandment and made it look beautiful. If you haven't watched the film or read the book Schindler's List, spoiler alert, I'm sorry. Oscar Schindler was a very rich businessman and successful entrepreneur in Nazi Germany. Did you know he was actually a member of the Nazi party? And he wore a pin on his jacket identifying him as such, but God got a hold of his heart. And he began becoming broken and horrified at the atrocities that he was seeing committed on his Jewish neighbors. So what did Oscar Schindler do? He began selling and giving away all of his great wealth to buy Jews off of the Nazi death camp lists, employ them in his factories to hide them from the Jews. And by the end of the war, Oscar Schindler's broke. It's estimated that because of Oscar Schindler's sacrifices, over 1,200 Jews were saved from a Holocaust. Do you know how many thousands that turned into? Generations of people alive because of one man's obedience to the second greatest commandment, to give away all of his great wealth to save lives. And if you've seen the film, at the end of the film, he's standing surrounded by hundreds of Jewish men, women, and children who owe Schindler their very lives. And as he's standing there, the announcement rings out that the war has won. The Allied troops are victorious. And they all begin to jump and leap and celebrate. But Oscar Schindler, he stands in the middle of them and he starts weeping. And his good friend comes up to him, a man who he, he saved, and he says, Oscar, what is wrong, my brother? And he looks at his best friend and he says, I, I could have saved one more. And his friend looks at him and he says, no, no, brother, no. And he looks at his golden pin which identifies him as a member of the Nazi party, and he says, my pin? Why did I keep this? I could have sold this and saved two more. And then he looks at his car, a fancy car, maybe the last item to his name, and he says, my car? My car? Why did I keep this? I could have sold this and saved ten more. And his brothers and sisters rally around him and pray and hug him and embrace him. And Oscar Schindler just keeps weeping and repeating the statement, I could have saved one more. Brothers and sisters, this came from a man who went to the wall to love his neighbor, who's broke at the end of a war because he gave it all away. The question that echoes from the halls of history from Bonhoeffer's time to our time today is a simple one, brothers and sisters. And that question is, do we take our Holocaust in 2022 as seriously as Oscar Schindler took it? If we do, if we truly do, then we can do something tonight to love our unborn neighbors and their mothers and fathers by trading wealth in exchange for human beings for lives spared from a holocaust bent on their destruction, I think that's one of the best trades ever made and that you could ever sow into the culture of death. So I'm gonna ask the table host to distribute the envelopes right now. Go ahead and grab that white envelope. If you haven't already, take out the giving sheets in there. Make sure everyone has a pen. And as you do that, and as we wind down, I just have a few closing comments as you distribute the donation envelopes to your beautiful friends at your table. I want to ask you for two things tonight. I'm going to break a rule of fundraising that says ask for one thing and one thing only, okay? I'm going to ask you for two things tonight. I'm going to ask you to make a sacrificial gift and also commit to a monthly amount. 
I'm not saying a one-time gift, all right, get that thinking out of your head, a sacrificial gift to Kentucky and Louisville Right to Life tonight. And if you're already a monthly partner, I'd like to thank you for your monthly partnership, okay? And if you are, consider doubling your monthly gift, all righty? If you and your spouse are talking about your sacrificial gift tonight, whatever number you were discussing, just go ahead and double it. And I'm sure it'll be a sacrificial gift. <laughs> and I'll run away after this so you can't get mad at me and Corey didn't ask me to say that, all right? I'm asking you to commit to those two things tonight. Your sacrificial gift helps fund the operations of these wonderful ministries at such a propitious moment. Brothers and sisters, whether Roe versus Wade gets overturned or not, our duty remains the same. But if it's overturned, states like Kentucky are going to be the leaders in this country, showing the rest of the country what it means to be an American, a patriot, and someone who loves their neighbors and stands for the rights of their neighbors. And the unborn child is the only neighbor that it is legal to kill. So your sacrificial gift tonight helps fund the vision and all of the new operations towards saving lives, changing minds, and changing hearts. And secondly, I want to ask you to commit to a monthly amount. This keeps their lights on, okay? This pays their staff. You probably know um, how much billions the abortion industry operates off of. It's incredibly discouraging at times. The very least we can do is ensure that our local Right to Life chapters have the <coughs> floodgates of heaven opened with more blessing than they know what to do with, doubling their staff, doubling their operations and goals and strategies to save the unborn. That's what your monthly gift funds tonight. And for the pastors and churches who give monthly to the local pregnancy resource centers and right to life chapters, thank you for your sacrificial partnership. Please bother your other pastor friends who don't give financially to these ministries and encourage them to do so, and send them the clip of me talking about Oscar Schindler, and if they don't weep and cry and feel a burden in their hearts, their soul is dead. Okay, so I want to ask you to commit to a monthly amount to, as well. Both gifts are vital, brothers and sisters, so let's commit the next few seconds to sacrificially love our unborn neighbors and their mothers and fathers. In the meantime, I'll see you on the battlefield. Now go out there and give them heaven, yeah? Seth Gruber, ladies and gentlemen, great job. Inspirational message, absolutely.